Good morning, everyone. Good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are, and welcome to this week's Weekly Energy Boost. My name is Ellie Sheva, and I am back today with Batya Solomon. Welcome, Batya. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me back on. I can't get enough, <laughs> as I'm sure our listeners agree. The Weekly Thank Energy you. Boost is a seven-day spiritual weather forecast where every week... We glean through the wisdom of Kabbalah to provide our listeners with the most powerful and practical tools to help you navigate the coming seven days, which inevitably leads to life lessons that you can apply any day, any week, any month, any year. This week is no different. We're talking about the Kabbalistic path to inner peace. And we ended last week's episode with a, a bit of a cliffhanger. So we're going to connect them. If you didn't hear last week's episode, you'll have to go back. But this week, we ended last week talking about how many times when we grow and we evolve and we elevate and we awaken, it rubs people the wrong way. They want the old us, the limited us, the um, complicit us, the passive us, or the angry us, or the jealous us, or the gossiping us. True. And I think, Batya, you wanted to bring that into this week because the, I think, and maybe... Please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. But I think one of the, if not the number one, one of the top interrupters of inner peace is other people, right? <laughs> <laughs> if we are, you know, you can imagine yourself sitting on a mountaintop meditating. Right. It's very easy when you're all alone <laughs> yeah. on a uh, Vipassana or something like that. Nobody's there to bother you. But when you got to go to the grocery store, you have to get on the highway or you have to turn on the television. You have to. Or live with people. Or live with other humans, <laughs> right? It's it's easy to live with the other kingdoms, but when it comes to the human kingdom, the the animate kingdom, animal kingdom, I guess is easier to live with. It's not easy. And, the, you know, the point I wanted to make last week is that just because other people don't approve or agree with your path doesn't make it the wrong path. That, to me, is one of the challenges maybe as a Pisces in being on a spiritual path is I want everybody to be okay okay and okay with me and I have found that especially when it comes to putting in, in installing boundaries for spiritual well-being it it often rocks the boat with people mm -hmm. you know before you used to say yes to everything now you're saying no right or before I could talk to you whenever you want and now you're busy. Mm -hmm. Or before I could text you at three o'clock in the morning and now I can't. <laughs> before I could come over and, I don't know, you know, there's so many different examples we can use. The, the And I want to give you a second to respond and rebut. But one of the things that I think is unique about what Kabbalah says about achieving inner peace is that it's not something you achieve. Our nature, or what Kabbalah calls our root, is stillness. Mm -hmm. The light force of the creator is not an active force. It's a, it's a static force. It is. We're the ones who are active in creating the vessel for it, creating the space for the light to be revealed, creating the, the opening for the light to come in. But the light itself is a still force it's not a forceful force and so our root is abundance our root is love our root is health our root is peace our root is serenity our root is certainty our root is calm and anything that's not those things is not us it's True. constructs of being a soul on the physical plane needing to wear a body and house an ego and an intellect and all the other things that comes with the bodysuit. But our true essence is peace. So what that means is that the wisdom of Kabbalah, if, if applied properly, is really about removing the interference that prevents us from feeling that stillness, feeling that tranquility, feeling that peace. So it's not, I've got to teach myself to do it. It's already there. I've got to tap into it. In those moments of chaos and challenge and drama, I need, if I want to achieve, if I want to experience, not achieve, if I want to experience that inner peace, I simply have to turn inward 
and tap into that which is already there. You know, I hear you, but I can see how that could be a very confusing concept for people. And people could hear you as saying, um, using the word peace, uh, replacing it with comfortable. Mm. You know, what is the one thing that is a, I'd say is a kind of a plague and even a sickness in our society today is everybody's looking for what can I, how can I be even more comfortable, even more comfortable? I don't have to get up anymore. I could just sit where I am, not move. And there's a button for everything. I don't have to go to the store anymore. I could just go on my, my laptop, my iPad, my, my smartphone, and I can order anything and not have to, the only thing that moves is my finger. <laughs> you know, because I'm comfortable. Guilty. But yes, we're all guilty. We're all guilty. We've all fallen into this, I would say, sickness of uh, looking for more and more comfortability. And what is the backlash of that is that more and more people are on antidepressants and more and more people are unhappy. The more comfortable we are, and it's, a par it's, 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 it's weird. It's like maybe a paradox. The more uncomfortable we are, the, uh, uh, or ironic, the more comfortable we are, the more sick our society is. I don't want to feel this pain, give me a pill. I don't want to feel that, give me something else. Let me have a drink, let me smoke, let me do something to numb the pain because I want to be painless or comfortable rather than what you're saying is finding that inner peace. They're not the same thing. Inner peace and being comfortable is not the same thing. So I just wanted to clarify For sure. That. What what comes to mind when you think of, you know, somebody asks you, I just want to be peaceful. I just want to be at peace. I just want to so be he, serene and yes, calm. There's, and that, that, there's the paradox right there. Because there's two forces at work here, right? There's the, the desire of the soul, which is how you described it, right? One with everything, magnanimous, abundant, loving, sharing, and wants to stay in that very high frequency, I would call it of love your neighbor as yourself. That's the ultimate. When we can live and stay in that high frequency of love your neighbor, not love your fellow human being who votes like you, looks like you, says the same things as you, no, or prays like you, no. Love your neighbor, the stranger, the person you don't know, but is part of the one human collective consciousness we all belong to. When we can reach that level, we have won the game of life. We are at that place called peace inner peace and then an expression of that is the peace in the world until we get there there's going to be a, a kind of like a buzz an annoying buzz in our system that uncomfortability is the war that is going on between our soul and our ego and the ego wants the comfortable and the ego doesn't want to deal with stuff and the ego wants to just uh suck other people's energy through their approval am i okay am i all right and then kind of blinds us to really what's important in life. And so many, you know, you've heard that term sheeple, you know, where people don't even stop. And what I call, what, what Rav Berg used to call uh, people who, who don't practice critical thinking skills, it seems to be almost like a lost art these days, is, you know, people who just follow the rules. Just tell me I'm okay. Oh, we're doing this now? Oh, the media says that's happening? Oh, I'll just follow along as long as I'm okay. Do I fit in with everybody? Am I adopting the right political uh, opinions? Or, you know, just I, I just want to be okay. Now that is the dark side of us. That's the ego. That is, I don't want to really take responsibility, look within, how do I feel about that? Is really that my truth? Does that resonate with me? Or am I coming now from? Am I coming from a place of magna, magnanimity, which is the soul I can afford, or am I coming from a place of fear, which is the ego? What's going to happen to me? Oh, I better do all the things they tell me and live in a very low resonance called fear, and that is where lots of chaos individually and collectively happens from that low resonance mindset of of fear. Now, to speak to your point of peace. So there's the ego, or what we call the opponent force, right? That just just shut up, put on your blinders, follow along, or because you're not okay. I've spoken this about. I spoke about this before. All hum, humans have a place in there in our hearts where we feel we're not okay, where we're carrying shame and guilt. You have to be very aware of that, and you have to protect that that spot that space within you. Because 
where, what is the cause of that shame and guilt? There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you. It's not about your sense of worthiness. Oh, that's what the lie is. I'm not worthy. I'm not enough. I'm not good enough. No. The shame and guilt we all have is once we incarnate into these earth suits, we forgot who we are. Because we forgot who we are, deep, deep down in our super conscious mind, we know we have to report back upstairs <laughs> and uh, because we have a contract. And we probably broke that contract, so uh, uh oh, I've got to go back upstairs and say like how I forgot to be the creator in this dimension. And because of that, that's where the opponent force constantly picks at us and distorts our reality in this world. So there's a, I'm going to go back to your point now. Now we uh, kind of had to lay the, the, the background there, or the foundation. So there's the, the part of me that wants to be at peace, right? Like everything you said, Elisheva. And then there's that other part, that's the war that's going on with us. Now, if I'm comfortable, I've lost the war. When we're comfortable, chances are we're, we're physically comfortable, we've numbed ourselves, we had a few too many drinks, or we, whatever we did to check out, binge watched, ate too much food, sugar, carbs, whatever it is, whatever our drug of choice is, of, of, or checking out, there, there that, that is not going to end well because when that binge is over, there's that feeling of a greater lower, not only lower uh, consciousness, but it's going to feel, we're going to feel even emptier and even guiltier and the, and the gap there, the disconnectedness between our conscious mind and our soul self, that, that gap gets wider. And th so we talked about last week, the whole idea of um, removing, you know, being in alignment. We talked about living in alignment. So the f place to start is, first of all, what's my truth? If I don't know my truth, if I'm not coming from a place of my truth, if I'm not coming from a place of compassion for my own flaws, for my own process, and, and again, there's nothing wrong with you. You're not broken. Don't think of yourself as broken. Don't think of yourself as having be, to be fixed because that's really a terrible narrative and it's, it's a, it's a no-win situation when you're thinking like that about yourself. Rather, you are God. You are a spark of divine that has been the veils have been covered, you know, you're kind of like a diamond, you fell into a garbage can, but you're still a diamond, no matter what's going on around you, you're still that diamond. So the climb out of the garbage can is that uncomfortable feeling of saying no to the dark side, no to the ego, keeping, when we continuously say no to the ego, it's uncomfortable, it's extremely painful to break an addiction, it's extremely painful to break out of and by the way, when I say addiction, I don't just mean like drugs or alcohol. I mean anything that you can't say no to becomes an addiction. What is in your life? Take a moment right now and think to yourself, who or what in your life can you not say no to? Whatever is in your life that you have such an attachment to it, you cannot say no to it. That thing, that event, that situation owns you. And that's an addiction. And so... By when on the road to inner peace, it's identifying those attachments, those unhealthy attachments, and little by little own, owning it, knowing it, and then consciously detaching from it. That will get us on the road to inner peace to reveal that which we already are. We are already rich. We are already love. We are already okay. We're already worthy. It's just that we get caught up and we look at the around in the garbage can of circumstances and we look at the garbage like, oh, I must be garbage because that's what I see around me and that's what people are telling me about me. No, remember who you are. You're a diamond. You are a diamond. Repeat after me. I am a diamond. <laughs> I am a diamond. Yes, I am a diamond. When things are happening to you, when people are telling you they don't approve of you, they don't like what you did, I am a diamond. Because if you're not coming from that place of I am a diamond, whatever your feedback is, it's coming to you is going to feel distorted. You're going to feel attacked. Maybe what the person is saying is true. Maybe you do smoke too much. Maybe you could lose a little weight. Maybe you could, <laughs> you know, be kinder to your spouse. Maybe those things are actually true. But if you're feeling attacked, you won't benefit from that feedback. I'm listening to what you're saying and what I always try to hear through the ears of our listeners. Right. And I'm thinking about That's two. That's a gift you have, by the way. Thank you. 
I am a diamond. Yes, you are. Shine bright like a diamond. Mm -hmm. We want to sing at some point in the episode. I'm just not sure when it is. It's it's not, it's not a Rihanna song. That's for sure. Um, So there's two scenarios in which I'm thinking might be most challenging for most people. One is on a personal level when things are chaotic, when, when, again, I'm going to be dating myself, but you have those Calgon moments where the kettle's blowing and the kids are screaming and the TV is blaring and there's someone at the door and you didn't have a chance to eat lunch yet. And there's all these different things that are compounding the pressure. Or it could also be something like um, maybe there is, I'm going to call it genuine in quotes, genuine chaos that something it, something happened to someone you love or there's bills to pay and there's no money to pay that that there the the external appears to be chaotic and hectic and scary a how do we achieve peace in those moments maybe i shouldn't give the b yet the the i shouldn't use the word achieve either no but the the point is if that inner peace exists and that's our nature that's who we really are how can we step into that or reconnect with that when you're having a calgon moment okay so First of all, the only, even though the chaos seems to be coming from out there, the only reason why it seems to be coming from out there is because it's happening in here. Meaning, I'm afraid to confront my own dark side. So that really, now stuff is gonna happen. No matter what, stuff is gonna happen. Events are gonna happen. But how we respond to those events will be will make the difference between living in chaos and being uplifted uplifted by those events. You know, people who make uh, lemonade out of the lemons of their life, right? It, this is really what we're talking about. How do you take the lemons of your life and turn them into lemonade? Um, and the and the answer to that is how we frame it within. How we frame it with it. So, um, if you're not having scary moments in your life, that means you're not growing. So those scary moments are there. Scary meaning how one way of interpret initial way, let's say, of interpreting a scary moment. I've got to move. Um, oh, oh, I I got fired. It's time for you know. I want to start a business. Um, I, I've always, I'm afraid of getting rejected. People I've, I've dated before or married before, they've cheated on me. I don't know if I can trust another human being again. I'm gonna, I want to open my heart, but it, it's too painful to trust. Whatever those challenges are, it's really not about what's happening out there. It's about what it triggers within us. And they'll always come that time where there's the war between the light and the dark. If you look at any story that's a classic or any any movie that's been around that people watch over and over again, you'll see it always has the same premise. There's there's the protagonist, there's the light, and it's a war with the darkness, uh, some form, whatever f- forms they take. Uh, and there's a war and the light will always win. And that's true. The reason why we listen to those stories, we love those stories, we watch the same movies, the the the, the re um, what do you call that uh, when they remakes of these different movies? I mean, I, I don't want to go into was it Fast and Furious number fifty seven and Rocky sixty five and you know and you've got uh, whatever you know the, the same. Oh, Tom Cruise just came back after fifty years with his Top Gun. You know, if it listen worked then, it could probably work now. But whatever, I didn't see the movie, but I could tell you he wins at the end, right? And and we know he's going to win at the end, by the way. And still, we're going to go see that movie or some movie like that. And the reason is, is because internally we want that reinforcement that the light is going to fight the darkness and the light's going to win. But no one can fight your darkness for you. You can watch fifty thousand movies; it won't make. It'll give you a five minutes worth of support. And you go, yeah, and you're right. And w- but when you have to face your own demon, let's say, your own dark side, the lies that the opponent force, the distortions that you've been sleeping and accepting without realizing, and there's going to come a point in your life, and it comes up, and I know it, and I don't, I don't say I think, I know it to be true because it is the human experience 
where you're going to have to face that lie the opponent has told you about yourself and it's and the opponent's going to uh, convince you that it's so painful you can't bear it so let's either go into denial or let's blame somebody else for it right but th there's no escaping once you and I've been through this and let me tell you it's not pretty and I wish I could say oh it's a walk in the park no it's not it's the dark night of the soul there's a, an amazing story as we learn uh, the uh, Kabbalists in interpret from the Bible from the Torah of Jacob and he's wrestling he's alone at night I don't have time to go into the whole background story but he's alone at night and he finds himself it says in the scripture that he there's a man and he wrestles with this man and then and he wrestles till dawn and the man now the scripture says the man is an angel and it says in the scripture so they're wrestling and then the angel says look I can't keep wrestling with you 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 won I can't exist when the light the dawn is coming the light is here I can't exist please release me he said I won't release you until you tell uh, tell me your name and give me a blessing. And the angel responds, "Why do you need to know my name? I bless you, Yisrael." Right. So it's a weird story, and then he releases him. Well, what what is that really talking about? It's not, you know, some history lesson or some fairy tale or something you should just swallow without without questioning it. It is referring to our own struggle from where we are to our next level. What's the angel? It looks like the angel doesn't answer his question. He doesn't say, he didn't say my name is. He says, why do you need to know my name? But that actually is the name of the angel. That's the dark night of our own soul where we're, we're coming from a place of insecurity. We're coming from a place of lack. We're coming from a place of nobody loves me. I'm not lovable. I'm not worthy. I'll never make it. I'll never achieve that business that I want. I'll never have the success. No one will ever love me. People only love me when they hit me. People only love me and then they abandon me. All of that, and we don't pierce through the veil of those lies. That's the angel inside of us is why do you need to know? Don't look so deeply have a drink, have a smoke, let's blame someone, let's judge somebody else, let's let's be in denial about all of that. But there's no escaping that. To the wor wor road of inner peace, you must pass through that toll. Must pass through that toll. And I can tell you, I've had in the last few years, especially after my, my uh, dying experience and coming back, I've had to pass through that toll a few times now and the good news is that once you recognize the sign, the first time is a real, oof, you need help with that. You know, it's hard to do that by yourself. That's why we have teachers and guides, mentors in the Kabbalah Center to help us when we get to that point. And once you get past the first one, you now recognize the signs. So you don't have to take it personally and it will help you for the next toll and the next toll and the next toll. The good news about it is once you pass that toll, you're living in a different time frame, a different timeline, a different life, truly. And, you know, we've, I think you've mentioned in other podcasts the idea of parallel realities. How do you go from one reality to another reality? I'm in a reality where I'm miserable, I'm broke, I'm this and that. I want to be living in that idealized reality. Well, one way to get there is you got to pass through that toll to get, and this is how you do it. I'm really breaking it down for you in a very practical sense. So... Uh, I don't know how to make it clearer. Maybe you have some questions or comments. Well, two things I want to say, and then I want to ask you another question. Oh, can I just add another thing Please. before you ask? This is not a logical process. And I wanted, I wanted to say that last week, and I just remembered for this podcast. What makes the Kabbalah path different, head and shoulders different from other ways of dealing with life, we don't try to be logical about it. We... we are coming from a place that's beyond logic and the five senses. We're constantly inviting the creator, our guardian angels. We're, we're through the Hebrew letters, through the Aramaic letters. Through, we have these sources that are metaphysical tools, metaphysical weapons against the dark side that you're not going to find in the realm of the five senses through logic and reason. And that makes all the difference of the in the world. So when we're reading about what I just described, and we read about it in the Zohar, for example, and we read, we really need that extra illogical help. How am I going to face my dark side, my d demon, my my negative angel? Right, the angel 
that he was fighting took on different forms throughout the night. It's, it started with a man, then it evolved into the angel of the what's called the Samech Mem, the, like the head of the dark side, and eventually by morning it was the angel Michael, Michael the angel, that was actually it helped and blessed him to help him go to his next level of, of, of evolution. So what does that tell us? That tells us that there's a, an event that happens we go through the dark night of our soul. The, the temptation is to blame the other person. They're the bully. They're the terrible person. Da, da, da. And no, it, we keep reclaiming it. No, it's me. It's my dark side. It's my dark side. It's my dark side. Until we break the klipa, until we break that lie, that veil, and then we feel that sense of unbelievable elation, that, that relief. But it's not coming from a logical place. It's coming from a place because we draw down and draw upon those tools. So when I, when you read in the Zohar, for example, about that story, when you're reading about it, when you're scanning about it, that energy of the story itself is what empowers you to do that. It actually helps us, it, it retunes us, it elevates our own frequency to strengthen us in a very illogical way. And that's, I think, so key and so important. I, I, it only reinforces what I was going to say before is that hopefully through this episode, we're realizing that inner peace is not a destination and it's not a reward. It's a frequency. Yes. It's something that at the base of everything else that's going on around us is, was, and always will be. And it's always there. Right. Right. It's not something that Always turns accessible. on and off. Yes. It's not different between men and women. It's not different between uh, in different stages of life. It is like the hum in the background that when everything is quiet, you can hear it, but it's always there for you to tap into. And it also doesn't matter what, what you believe in, who you believe in, what religion you belong to, how you identify yourself. Creation is creation. The spiritual law, like the like the physical laws of gravity and, and aerodynamics, they don't care what you believe in and what you look like and how much money you make. They apply to everybody equally. And it's the same thing here with Kabbalah. That's why I love Kabbalah. It's so universal, uh, despite what we choose to believe or think or whatever. It exists like, like you were saying, this state of peace exists within us this very moment. You have in this moment the power and the capability to tap into that frequency any time you want. Any time. Think about this. You don't have to go to university. You don't have to jump through a lot of hoops. You can just tap into it any time you want. And the, the toll I was referring to is if you feel that you can't, you can't real, feel it, you don't know where it is, then that toll that I just described to you is the doorway to that. You can go through that doorway, or if you've got another one, you can touch it for a few seconds, a few moments, a few hours. The idea is for us to stay in that frequency permanently. And that's why we're on planet Earth, and that's why we're experiencing what we're experiencing, the challenges that we're experiencing with ourselves and with other people are opportunities for us to realize that all of this, like Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, we could have always clicked our heels and we'd be home. We didn't have to go through that whole trip down the yellow brick road. That's something that, you know, the human mind in a way, like, no, that's too easy. Give me some hard things to do. Let me go find the witch's broom or whatever. And we all have our own version of that. That's why that's a classic, by the way. What's the message? And I love that story. What's the message? You, you had it in with you had it within you all the time. All the time. That's all you had to do. And it's such a beautiful message. So you created a great segue for the second for the B okay. question. And I think we'll probably only have time to finish up with that. I'm very Zen, Batya. I live a very peaceful, compassionate, loving life. Sure you do. But <laughs> the circus happening in our planet. On our in our world, in our country, in, between other countries, right? What's uh, you you turn on the you open your phone, you turn on the television. No matter where you look, there is chaos and panic and destruction and all the good reasons not to be at peace. Or so the narrative seems to be. Okay, so my question for you is, how can what what is the best practice for our listeners when? we're inundated with all of the chaos and destruction and everything that's going on in the world. 
how do we find that, connect with that okay. part of ourselves then? So the opponent lives within us and around us. Now, what's what we see playing out in the global scheme of things is the collective consciousness of the opponent playing with all our heads. As someone once pointed out to me, you know, media only makes money by people watching the media. And what motivates people is fear. So if they keep playing fearful things, oh my God, what's gonna happen today? Let me, let me find out the news. So, and that state of fear is a very low frequency with, by which a person who stays in that low frequency, first of all, it's a destructive frequency, physically, mentally, emotionally, and it makes that person very vulnerable to being controlled by the, well, let's not talk about people because in the, in the big picture, there's two forces. There's the light that's always there. And then the game of life is removing the f veils of illusion of lack and darkness. And that plays itself out. And how does it play itself out? In the cumulative collective consciousness of, of fears. So, as Rav Ashlag, the founder of the Kabbalah Center, um, wrote, he said that, here, and here's something that logically doesn't make sense. But if you, if you study science, science is now starting to catch up with you know, the Kabbalistic principles that have been known for millennium or even longer, uh, that we are all beings, immortal beings, that exist in levels of frequency. In fact, all the physical world are levels of frequency. And so the individual frequency that each of us is uh, operating on affects the collective consciousness. So when I change my frequency and I wake up, listen to last week's <laughs> podcast, I wake up and I realize, wow, I am, I am operating on an extremely low frequency. I'm depressed. I'm fearful. I'm worried about myself alone. I'm just in that survival mode. No, I'm going to choose through, through acts of kindness, through acts of love, through acts of sharing. This is how you, you raise the frequency. I'm going to make a conscious choice to act from a place of compassion to my, towards myself and towards my fellow human beings. I'm going to choose to regard each human being and all, all of creation with respect and human dignity, I'm going to raise my frequency because the individual equals the collective consciousness. So the more of us that are thinking like this and we choose to negate the narrative because it's just a narrative, it's just somebody's opinion, and we don't really know what the truth is. There's so much controversy about what, you know, if you watch different news channels, they'll, they'll report the same event, if you don't believe me, and they'll report the same event, but from different narratives. So there you can see that what is the real truth? We don't know, which we know there's different narratives, but I don't care about those narratives. I want to be in a place where I'm contributing to global peace. I want to dispense with that. I want to be living in a higher vibration and I want everyone else before their own good to live in that higher vibration. So I'm going to it choose to inject love, respect, and human dignity. And as much as I'm being tempted to blame people for whatever, because they don't agree with my opinion politically or otherwise about anything, I choose to give them respect and human dignity uh, and give them the space to have their opinion without, without trying to push it on me, give them the space as long as they're not hurting someone else, then I'm actually contributing to global peace and removing that chaos. And, as, and when enough of us do that, we reach that critical mass, you will see like Jacob and the angel will shift the light, the light of the creator, the light that's within us all along is just waiting to be fully revealed through us. That's what's happening here. And so unfortunately, if we don't proactively do it, we are causing it, you know, a, a wake up call and this is what's happening today. It's a wake up call to wake up and start to question what the heck is going on and what can I really do about it? I don't, I don't, I just don't. The reason why this human trafficking, this violence, there's, you know, all of the horrible things that are going on in this world is because we have a tolerance for it. 
the minute that the critical conscious, the critical mass of consciousness will say, no, I don't accept it. I don't agree with it. No, I, I choose to inject light and love. And I know humanity is going to wake up as I wake up. Then the individual equals the collective consciousness. So when you realize how powerful you are and how precious your thinking is, then you're going to be a lot more cautious about, wait a second, where am I choosing to park my thoughts right now? Am I parking my thoughts in the garbage can or am I parking my thoughts at a higher level? Because remember, a high tide supports all ships. I love that. That's one of my favorite quotes. A high tide supports all ships. I don't know about you, but I, I have committed myself to be one of the purveyors of the high tide. I'm just going to insist that there's light in this world, that I'm going to inject light. I'm going to read my Zohar. I'm going to spread Zohar. I'm going to meditate on all the world that wake up, lovingly wake up, put down the arms of destruction, the thoughts of destruction, and let's influence the world for the greater good. We can change the narrative. You don't have to ex uh, accept when we're sleeping, we're accepting the negative narr narrative of the opponent. It's not about people. It's about the opponent force that's, that's working its way through other people. So don't blame those other people. Put your focus to the source. And that is that negative force, that, that anti-light force that is in the world that is designed to help us to wake up. Eventually, it's going to be working, and it is working towards our greater good anyway. So by using compassion... And it doesn't mean that people can step, well, when I say compassion, it doesn't mean that a murderer shouldn't be uh, dealt with justice. Yeah, a murderer definitely should be dealt with justice. The, you know, the, the person did something and there's an effect to that, exactly. But it doesn't mean I have to call people names. It doesn't mean that uh, just because I don't agree with someone that I cancel them out. You know, there is space for a difference of opinion and respect and human dignity. Let's all work towards that. <laughs> you just I'm just enjoying so thoroughly listening to Batya. Um, Looking at me with the eyes of love. Yes, I love you too. Fangirling. <laughs> um, I want to end the episode with uh, a metaphor I'm borrowing from a parenting person I follow who always has these beautiful nuggets. Her name is Dr. Becky. And so she was talking about how she gave the metaphor of, um, and I'm using, I want to use the metaphor for all instances. She specifically meant it between a parent and a child. But imagine that in this world, if what Batya said is true, in each one of us is like a pilot on an airplane. And we're all experiencing turbulence right now, right? Mm -hmm. So imagine you're on an airplane and there's turbulence and you're nervous and you're holding the armrests and you're kind of talking to the God the way sometimes we do when we're a little bit nervous like that. Imagine the pilot gets on the loudspeaker and says, stop screaming. There's nothing to be worried about. It's going to be fine. Everything is fine. Right. So obviously in that moment, you're the the hysteria is not contributing to your certainty and inner peace. It's actually making it worse. Wait. One second. There's nothing to be worried about. So why am I worried? Right. It's mm -hmm. like you suddenly questioning your trusting yourself and everything. She gives a second example. So imagine the pipe. It's turbulent again. You're grasping your armrests. You're you might even be talking to the person next to you or screaming, depending on how bad the turbulence is. And the pilot gets on the loudspeaker, loudspeaker and says, stop it. You're making me scream. I don't know what to do either. You better calm down so I can calm down. <laughs> Right. That's obviously not the pilot you want flying your plane. Right. And then the third example is, of course, what we're accustomed to is, ladies and gents, this is your captain speaking. There's a lot of turbulence right now. I know this feels scary. That's OK. I know what I'm doing. I'll keep you safe. Right. right. That's what we want to hear. So I love that metaphor. First of all, it's great for parenting. Right. How, how, what, par what kids need from us right. when sure. they're scared, upset, angry and all that stuff. But what it also says to me is that that third voice, the voice that we want to hear from the pilot, the voice that our kids want to hear from us, that's really the voice of the creator. That's really that, that's who we naturally are. That's our, that, that reservoir that we can tap into in those turbulent moments. That's what it's saying. Can I tell you a funny story? Please. True story. Many, hundreds of years ago, 
before the center. On TWA? I, <laughs> were you on TWA? That's no, a Pan Am? I was, I was a flight attendant, actually. Yeah, okay, there <laughs> yes, you go. Many years ago. For a charter airline that, like Voldemort, shall not be named. Anyway, I we had a the worst flight. If, if everything or anything could go wrong, it was the worst flight with between the air conditioning and not being able to land the plane and having to stop, make an emergency stop to refuel and running out of food and on the plane. It was though it was like the the trip to hell and back. Terrible. It was ten hours to the point when we finally landed. I was a frazzled mess. And people got off the <laughs> the flight as they were leaving. They go, this is the worst <laughs> like cursing us. <laughs> Oh my God! Cursing us as they got off the flight. It, it was it was terrible, and I was in the worst mood. I was angry. I was frustrated. I was like a victim of these people, of this airline, of this job. I was just angry. I got off the plane. I was angry, and when, there was another flight attendant, and uh, I was giving him a ride home. And you would think this guy just got off the plane and just from vacation in Hawaii or something like that. He was smiling. He was calm. He was like, I I looked at him and I wanted to kill him. I was <laughs> so angry and frustrated. And he's smiling and he's making jokes and not like not one hair. <laughs> if you looked at me, I, I was like, I went through the, the ringer. It was, and it, I just, I think for me, that was the light putting that person in my life to show me that no matter what is going on out there, what's going on inside is the most important thing. It's the thing. only thing that counts. It's the only thing that counts. And, and, and for me, it was a marvel that I, this person could have that equi equanimity about them while, you know, I allowed my, it's exactly what I just spoke about. I allowed my mindset to go down, down, down to the lowest frequency with everything. I let the events control me rather than me controlling my response to the events like this person. I, I think I, I think that the one of the most powerful things you said today wasn't said. And that was when you look outside of yourself or even in your own personal world and you see chaos, the the I, perhaps it's easier to see when it's in your personal life, but even when you look outside your window, you look on the news and you think it's going to hell in a handbasket, mm -hmm. the most powerful thing that you can do is not Think that. Exactly. That you, That's the hardest you, thing. Tapping into that natural stillness that we all have within us is actually the solution to the chaos that's going on that, around. The panic, the fear, doesn't mean you shouldn't hug your kids when they get right. home, doesn't mean you shouldn't, you know, the, the knee-jerk reaction that unfortunately it, it's very brief. We call it the 9-11 syndrome, right? For a while everybody loved everybody and everybody was kind and caring and we didn't take anything for granted. How long did that last? Right. Right. Not long enough. Not long enough because the real awakening is to turn inward right. and to tap into the pilot within who's calm and knows it's going to be fine no matter how difficult or shaky or ugly it is right now. It is, it's going to be okay because it already is okay. And by you plugging into that broadcast within, you naturally elevate the environment around you, whether the environment is your home or your office or your neighborhood or the world. So even if people don't agree with your spiritual awakening, let's go back to the original point we wanted to make. Uh, that's their issue. Don't make it your issue. When you change, every every family unit has got their own dance steps. And you see this especially in dysfunctional families, which most families are, by the way. And so when somebody starts to create new dance steps, everybody else gets frazzled and get uh, upset and nervous because what are you doing? You're changing the dance steps. Even if that person is doing something good, like you know, they're breaking a negative habit or they're not self-destructing anymore, on an energetic level, the other people in the group are disturbed because there's a change and they don't know how to deal with it. Don't take it on. Don't make it your problem. When you are, again, finding your place, your alignment in the world, of course there's going to be pushback. That's actually a good sign. It means you're making a difference. So don't judge yourself. Don't, don't, don't connect that to your self-esteem. Instead, treat those people with compassion, and you keep doing what's good for you spiritually, that, that you're bringing more light to the world, that you're helping, again, raise the tide for everyone. 
So I salute you in that. If you're in that process, stay strong and keep doing what you're doing. Eventually, they're going to thank you for it. Maybe not in this lifetime, but eventually they'll thank you for it. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> thank you, Batya, for joining us again, joining me again. The Weekly Energy Boost is available on YouTube, Spotify, wow, YouTube, Facebook, Week. Let's try this again. The Weekly Energy Boost is available on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and everywhere podcasts are found. You can also visit our website, weeklyenergyboost.com, to see what else we have going on that we think our listeners should be tuned into. And as always, if you're listening now on the podcast, we invite you to pause, rate, and review. It helps us reach more people. It helps us uh, find, find souls who are needing this and don't even realize that they're needing it. And as always, um, if you want to send us a message, you can do so by emailing us at energyboost at kabbalah.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being here, Batya. If you want to hear my classes, Prosperity Shoot. Principles on Kabbalah.com, I'd uh, love to have you join. It also, uh, the class is uh, followed by a live Q&A, so you can interact with me personally if you like. So I'll see you there. It's, it's, worth a, it's worth a click. It certainly is. We'll see you next week on the Weekly Energy Boost. Bye-bye.